Welcome. Last month in Sydney, Australia, they threw an annual event called the Festival of Dangerous Ideas. One of the main speakers was David Simon, the writer and producer who created The Wire and Treme, two television series that vividly portray the vast gap between rich and poor. Nothing drives that great divide home, he said, like our prison system. You're seeing the underclass hunted through a, a war on uh, dangerous drugs, allegedly, that is in fact merely a, a war on the poor and has turned us into the most incarcerative state uh, in the history of mankind at this point, in terms of just the sheer numbers of people we've put in, in American prisons. No other country on the face of the earth jails people at the, at the number and rate that we are. He's right, of course. During the past 30 years, the number of inmates in federal custody has grown by 800 percent, and half of them are serving sentences for drug offenses. According to the Sentencing Project, an advocacy group dedicated to changing how we think about crime and punishment, more than 60 percent of the people in prison are now racial and ethnic minorities. This book woke people up. The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander. She was my guest more than three years ago when the book was first published. An outstanding work of scholarship on how our war on drugs, our harsh mandatory minimum sentencing, and racism have converged to create a caste system in this country very much like the one under Jim Crow segregation laws. None of us at the time anticipated the powerful impact her book would have. It became a bestseller spurred an even wider conversation about justice and inequality, and transformed Michelle Alexander from attorney and professor to an activist and advocate for an end to our dehumanizing penal system. Michelle Alexander, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. When the book came out, um, one reviewer called it the Bible of a social movement. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the apostles and the disciples and the church spreading. Have you seen the signs of a movement? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it has me so encouraged. As I travel from city to city, and I've been speaking in churches and at universities, I've been speaking inside prisons and reentry centers, just an incredible range um, of venues. I see over and over again um, people who are dedicating their lives now. Um, to ending the system of mass incarceration, to raising consciousness, people of faith who are organizing their church communities, um, organizing within mosques, um, holding study circles, holding film festivals, and then organizing and mobilizing their memberships or their congregations. I'm especially encouraged by formerly incarcerated people who are finding their voice um, and organizing to demand the restoration of their basic civil and human rights. Um, organizations like All of Us or None, which has successfully um, you know, achieved ban the box um, legislation. Ban and the box? Ban the box on employment applications. The you know, box on employment applications that ask that dreaded question, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And of course, it doesn't matter whether you've been convicted of a felony a few weeks ago or 40 years ago. For the rest of your life, you're labeled a felon and then subject to legal discrimination for the rest of your life. And what are those ex-felons, what have they been telling you about what it's like to come out and try to get back into the society to which they have paid for their sins? I think it's just an extraordinary challenge. I mean, I think most people have this sense that when you're released from prison, well, yeah, life is hard. But if you really dedicate yourself, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, you know, knock on enough doors, you'll get that job, you'll get your life back together. It may be hard, but if you really try, you can do it. But what I've learned, you know, over the years from working with um, many formerly incarcerated people and forming close friendships with many people who've been released from prison, is that it, it's not just hard, it's often impossible. You're released from prison, often with you know, maybe $20 in your pocket, have nowhere to sleep. You try to return home, maybe to your family who lives in pu public housing. Your family risks eviction in many places if they just even allow you to come home. Um, felons can be excluded from public housing. Whole families can risk eviction if they allow people with felonies to come home to them. Trying to get a job can be next to impossible. Um, 
you know, people say, well, well, they could get a job at, you know, Burger King or, you know, some minimum wage job. No, actually, you know, many low wage um, jobs are for all practical purposes off limits to people who have felonies. Hundreds of professional licenses are off limits to people who have felonies. In my state in Ohio, until just recently, you couldn't even get a license to be a barber uh, if you'd been convicted of a felony. Food stamps may be off limits to you if you've been convicted of a drug felony. Um, you know, what are people released from prison expected to do? Apparently what we expect them to do is to pay hundreds or thousands of dollars in fees, fines, court costs, accumulated back child support, which continues to accrue while you're in prison. And in a growing number of states, you're actually expected to pay back the costs of your imprisonment. <laughs> and paying back all these fees, fines, and court costs may be a condition of your probation or parole. And then if you're one of the lucky few, the very few who even manages to get a job straight out of prison, up to 100% of your wages can be garnished to pay back all those fees, fines, court costs. Um, How do you explain this, given the fact that this is a society that celebrates uh, second chances for politicians in particular, <laughs> a society that is built around the theme of renewal, born again, mm -hmm. uh, and yet doesn't extend that same act of forgiveness to people who have paid for their sins? Well, we say we're a society that supports second chances, but in reality, we're not. And I think um, the reason to fully understand what's happened in this country with respect to mass incarceration, you have to look back at least 40 years um, to um, the law and order movement that was born um, in the midst of the civil rights movement. You know, when civil rights advocates were beginning to violate segregation laws and sit in at lunch counters and um, desegregate trains and buses, um, violating what they believed were unjust laws, um, segregationists said, you know, this is leading to the breakdown of the respect for law. We need law and order in this country. Um, and the call for law and order was in direct response to um, the civil rights movement and the nonviolent civil disobedience um, the protesters were engaged in. Um, but this law and order movement began to take on a life of its own um, as crime rates began to rise in urban areas and um, some politicians began to say, you know, this rising crime is a symptom of this attitude of lawlessness that is spreading through the nation. We need to get tough. We need to crack down. We need law and order. And as I've documented at great length in the book and many other political scientists and historians have as well, the Get Tough movement and the war on drugs really is traceable to a backlash against the gains of African Americans in the civil rights movement and a radical shift in mentality that occurred where as a nation we ended the war on poverty and declared the war on drugs. A wave of punitiveness really swept the nation on the heels of the civil rights movement. And this attitude um, has infected not only our criminal justice system, but our education system that now has a zero tolerance policy for school discipline infractions right. um, and has led to this prison building boom, unlike anything the world has ever seen. How have mandatory minimum sentences contributed to that? Well, mandatory minimum sentences ensures that you will get the harshest possible sentence um, under law, the mandatory minimum sentence. And so it shifts power to prosecutors so that prosecutors can then say to you, will you take this plea or else you're going to get this harsh mandatory minimum sentence? Um, and it gives prosecutors the power um, to, you know, encourage plea deals. Um, you know, in the federal system, I think 97 to 98 percent of all, you know, charged cases result in a plea, not a trial, because people are terrified of facing these harsh mandatory minimum sentences. And it ensures that it's up to the prosecutor, not the judge, um, you know, what kind of a sentence you receive. And mandatory minimum sentences has a lot to do with the exponential increase in our prison population in the United States. Um, and today, you know, even in this era of Obama, in this time of supposed colorblindness, um, 
we now have created a system of mass incarceration, a penal system unprecedented in world history. We have the highest rate of incarceration in the world, dwarfing the rates of even highly repressive regimes like Russia or China or Iran. Um, and the majority of the increase um, in incarceration in the United States have been among impoverished people of color who, once they're swept into the system, are then stripped of the very rights supposedly won in the civil rights movement. Um, and yet the topic of mass incarceration uh, has been one you know, that has been rarely raised. Is there research that confirms that the backlash is against black criminals or against criminals, just crime? Well, there is. There's an enormous amount of research that suggests that the backlash and the punitive impulse was not simply in response to crime, but was uh, much more deeply connected um, to racial attitudes, racial fears and anxieties. And in fact, you know, the political strategists who conceived of the Get Tough movement and the war on drugs quite deliberately um, used not so subtle racial appeals and racial code language um, with the purpose of trying to exploit both conscious and unconscious racial biases and stereotypes for political gain. Um, the Southern strategy um, by which Richard Nixon was elected president. Yes, yes. The basis of the Southern strategy was using these kind of racially coded get tough appeals on issues of crime and welfare to appeal to poor and working class whites, particularly in the South, who are anxious about, threatened by, resentful of many of the gains of African Americans in the civil rights movement. And to be fair, I think we have got to acknowledge that poor and working class whites really had their world rocked by the civil rights movement. Um, you know, wealthy whites could send their kids to private schools, um, give their kids all of the advantages um, that wealth has to offer. But poor and working class whites in the South, many of whom were themselves struggling for survival, um, who were desperately poor, often illiterate, um, they were the ones who might have to ship their kids across town to go to a school they believed were inferior. It was them, they uh, who were suddenly forced to compete on equal terms for limited jobs with this whole group of people they've been taught their whole lives to believe were inferior to them. And this state of affairs did create an enormous amount of fear, resentful resentment and anxiety, and an enormous political opportunity. What about now? Other. How do you see that playing well, out? Well, I see it most obviously in the immigration debate. Today, we see that this fear of immigrants coming across the border to take jobs and uh, to take educational resources and who are going to drain the uh, tax base of your county, these fears that they are coming to take from you um, is leading and has led to another sort of get tough movement. Um, get tough on them, those immigrants who have violated the law by crossing over. And this wave of punitiveness now directed towards immigrants is leading to the same kind of indifference um, towards their basic humanity um, that we have seen in the war on drugs and the get tough movement that led to the rise of mass incarceration. I mean, race has been used as a wedge again and again um, throughout American history to divide um, the lower classes, if you will, and um, to create uh, an environment um, in which poor and working class people are pit against one another. But that does not mean that, you know, all or even most yeah. poor and working class white folks are harboring any conscious racial resentments. I know that there are those folks out there for sure. But I think much of it um, lies in the unconscious stereotypes and fears and biases that we all have within us um, that get exploited in these moments where groups are scapegoated um, and fears are stoked, um, resulting in you know, the emergence of these new systems. I mean, we are having mass deportation today at the same time as we are having mass incar incarceration. Mass deportation, I must say, by a black president. Absolutely. It's one of the great ironies, just as it's 
you know, an irony that the greatest escalation of the drug war was under President Clinton, who, you know, many African Americans called our first black president. <laughs> right, I remember that. And it was President Clinton, you know, a Democrat, um, who escalated the drug war far beyond what President Reagan or President Nixon had even dreamed possible. And it was the Clinton administration that championed laws banning drug offenders even from federal financial aid for schooling you know, upon their release, um, banning drug offenders and people with criminal convictions from, you know, public housing. Um, you know, to a large extent, many of the rules, laws, policies, and practices that now constitute this caste-like system um, were championed by a Democratic uh, president and administration desperate to win back those so-called white swing voters, well, the folks who had defected from the Democratic Party in the wake of the civil rights. I was going to ask you, what do you think is the dynamic that drove Clinton and now drives Obama? Is it, is it to satisfy the base they think most hostile to them? I think so. And, you know, what I find most unfortunate, though, um, of the politics that have developed over the years, the politics of trying to appease, um, you know, poor and working class whites, not by building explicitly multiracial, multiethnic, you know, coalitions and alliances that encourage solidarity across racial and class lines, but instead by kind of tossing these um, symbolic bones um, you know, saying, well, we're, we're escalating the drug, or we're getting tough on them. Don't you feel better now? Um, we're willing to get tough by deporting even more immigrants than ever have been deported before. Don't you feel better now? Um, we fall into the trap of really playing to people's, you know, baser fears and instincts rather than um, risking perhaps some short-term losses. Um, but building the kind of unity and the kind of solidarity across race and class lines, which I believe would help to ensure a much more stable foundation for the kind of multiracial, multiethnic, inclusive democracy that I would hope for. Um, which is why my great hope does not lie with President Obama right. or our elected politicians, no matter how well-meaning or well-intentioned they may be. You have talked recently in um, a, a way different from how you were talking three and a half years ago. You've been talking about moving out of your own lane. What are you suggesting? Yeah, well, you know, right around the anniversary of the March on Washington, I found myself doing a fair amount of internal reflection about um, my own role um, at this time in building the kind of movement that I would hope for for social justice. And what I had to admit to myself is that for the last few years, you know, I have spent all of my working hours talking about mass incarceration and trying to raise consciousness about what has happened in this country, how we've managed to birth a caste-like system again, you know, that there are more African Americans under correctional control today in prison or jail, on probation or parole, than were enslaved in 1850, that wow. we've, we've created this vast new system again, and to try to raise consciousness so that people would wake up to this reality. And I realized that as well-intentioned as all that work was, it was leading me to a place of relatively narrow thinking, that I wasn't connecting the dots between other kinds of social injustices that are occurring here in the United States and abroad to the work that I was committed to and the cause that I had been committed um, There was a larger the breakdown years. of democracy that affected more people than African Americans in prison or immigrants being deported. You're saying that the system is broken down. Absolutely. The entire system has been broken down, and it's really, I think, um, at its root about a failure on our part to develop a moral consensus about how we treat one another. Um, you know, for me, I have to care. If I care about a young man serving, you know, 25 years to life for a minor drug crime, if I care about him and care about his humanity, ought I not also care equally about a young woman who's facing deportation back to a country she hardly knows and had 
lived in only as a child and can barely speak the language and ought I not be as equally concerned about her fate as well? Ought I not be equally concerned about a family um, whose loved ones were just killed by drones in Afghanistan? Um, ought I not care equally for all? And that really was Dr. King's um, insistence at the end of his life that we ought to care about the Vietnamese as much as we care and love our people at home. So I think we ought to commit ourselves to building a human rights movement in this country, a human rights movement for education, not incarceration, for jobs, not jails, a movement that will end all these forms of legal discrimination against people released from prison, discrimination that denies them basic human rights to work, to shelter, to education, to food. You don't think practical politics leads you where you want to go? No. I think that the system, as it is designed today, with the, the amount of money that influences who gets elected and who even has a shot um, of holding office in the United States today, um, I think that the way the system is currently designed does not allow um, for uh, that kind of policy change to occur. We're going to have to build a movement that changes the nature of politics itself, that takes money and the profound influence of money out of politics, um, and is one that is not a, you know, a win-lose, winner-take-all kind of system. Um, today we have Democrats and Republicans battling it out with people joining camps and thinking that somehow through this war of demonizing the opposition we're going to come up with um, solutions that genuinely benefit all. I think that's deeply misguided. Um, we're going to have to become more creative about how we do democracy in the United States, um, but it begins, I believe, um, with people in their communities um, organizing around the issues that matter most to them. Aren't you talking in some instances about uh, ghettoized communities that where unemployment is high, uh, families are in distress, yes. schools are falling apart, uh, and there are very few life support systems. How do they organize? It's, ex it's incredibly difficult incredibly difficult, but it's not impossible. I'm inspired by people like Susan Burton, for example. Um, she's the executive director of an organization in Los Angeles called A New Way of Life. Mm. And Susan is an African-American woman who became addicted to crack cocaine after a Los Angeles Police Department officer ran over her five-year-old boy. And if Susan, you know, had been middle class, upper middle class, she might have had a good health care plan and might have been able to get good legal drugs <laughs> to help her cope with her depression and her grief, but things were different for Susan. She became addicted to crack cocaine and spent 15 years cycling in and out of prison and jail, every time tossed out onto the street, unable to get work or even drug access to drug treatment, cycling in and out for 15 years. Finally, she gets access to a private drug treatment program, becomes clean, is given a job, and decides to dedicate her life to ensuring that no other woman would ever have to go through what she has gone through. And now Susan runs five safe homes for formerly incarcerated women in Los Angeles, providing them desperately needed shelter, support, finding work, reunifying with their families. But beyond that, she is part of All of Us or None and is organizing formerly incarcerated people in California and nationwide to demand the restoration of their basic civil and human rights. And so what's happening is phenomenal. So they could become full citizens again. And with the leadership of organizations like All of Us or None, they've succeeded in banning the box on employment applications in the entire state of California. Um, you know, there are enormous victories that are being achieved precisely because the people who we have written off and viewed as disposable are reclaiming their voice, standing up, speaking out, organizing, even as they struggle to survive. And so, you know, my own view is that in building this movement, we've got to be able to do a number of things simultaneously. We've got to be able and committed to building under an underground railroad for people who are released from prison, people who need desperate 
help finding shelter and food as they try to make a break for real freedom. But we've also got to be willing to work for abolition at the same time. Abolition of the system of mass incarceration as a whole. And I see people like Susan Burton and so many others miraculously managing to do these things at the same time. And so I hope that you know, people will donate generously to these organizations, which often don't receive the level of funding from foundations they deserve, um, and also find ways to donate their time and their energy um, to this work and be part of this movement in a direct way. Aren't there some signs of progress on the issues that, that, that concern you? Attorney General Eric Holder has begun to advocate for some reform of our mandatory minimum sentences. Here he is speaking to the American Bar Association. Take a listen. I have today mandated a modification of the Justice Department's charging policy so that certain low-level, nonviolent drug offenders who have no ties to large-scale organizations, gangs, or cartels will no longer be charged with offenses that impose draconian mandatory minimum sentences. They. It's a very encouraging sign. Um, it suggests that at least with, for a small category of cases, um, mandatory minimum sentences will no longer um, be automatically sought by federal prosecutors. Um, and it's a positive step in the right direction. Um, it, it doesn't go all the way. <laughs> Mandatory sentences are still on the books and will still apply um, to thousands of people um, who, you know, may be dubbed as having some kind of gang-related um, connections. And of course, those kind of connections do not have to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And you know, in a number of states across the United States, in recent years, um, mandatory minimum sentences for drug crimes, nonviolent drug crimes have been reduced and we've seen for the first time in 40 years state prison populations beginning to decline. Um, the federal prison population is still rising um, and most of the people who are incarcerated in federal prisons are there due to drug offenses and immigration violations. So um, we still see um, you know, the federal prison population rising, but the state po prison population is beginning to decline. And that is reason for hope. But my concern is that the primary reason that legislatures have begun um, to ease up some of their harsh mandatory minimum sentences is not because of genuine concern for the people whose lives have been destroyed or the communities that have been decimated by the drug war. But instead, um, these changes have been motivated largely because of the fiscal crisis. They can't afford these prisons anymore. Yes, these states find that there's no way to maintain these massive prison systems without raising taxes on the predominantly white middle class. So they've been willing to downsize a bit. Well, take California. Uh, former Governor Schwarzenegger said they had been investing too much in prisons and not enough in schools. But ultimately, it turns out that what he was proposing wasn't altogether downsizing. It was privatizing the, pri yes. the prisons so that the responsibility for them uh, was transferred to for-profit corporations. And I ask you, what happens when there's a profit motive to send pre people to prison? <laughs> well, when there is a profit motive, uh, it ensures that more and more people will be locked up and remain locked up in order for companies to maintain their profit margins. Um, you know, the largest prison company, private prison company in the United States, um, the Corrections Corporation of America, sent a letter to 48 governors, basically, with an offer. We will buy your state-run prisons in exchange for a promise, a guarantee that you will keep these prisons filled at least 90% right. capacity. Um, you know, these kinds of agreements and incentives are not in the public interest. Um, you know, what would be in the public interest is, you know, a commitment to reducing crime so that our 
prisons empty, but instead private prisons want a commitment um, from state governors that these prisons will be kept filled by any means necessary, which virtually ensures a high level of commitment by politicians to these get tough measures, mandatory sentences, war on drugs to keep prison beds filled. So, In fact, Arizona, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and I believe Virginia all have privatized prisons that are kept at 80, at 95 to 100 percent occupancy because they have guaranteed that occupancy to uh, the private industry, even if the crime rate falls. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, that's what's most worrisome <laughs> is that they will insist and have insisted on keeping their beds full, even if crime rates are relatively low. And today, you know, crime rates nationally are at historical lows, but incarceration rates um, are higher than they ever have been. Well, and some people argue, as you know, that the crime rate nationally is down because we've been locking up the people who commit the crimes. Yes, which has been proven to be demonstrably false. Um, you know, if you look at the data, it shows that, you know, states that have been on an incarceration binge um, do not necessarily have lower crime rates than states that have incarcerated people at a lower rate. There is no clear connection between incarceration rates and crime rates. And in fact, in cities like Chicago and in New Orleans, New Orleans is the incarceration capital of the world, um, you know, they have some of the highest violent crime rates uh, in the country as well. And the same can be said for Chicago. In fact, you know, a growing number of researchers and sociologists now believe that um, incarceration rates, high levels of incarceration actually can be a contributor to high crime rates because you're incarcerating, incarcerating such a large percentage of a community or population, you're ensuring that um, people are going to be locked out of work and locked out of housing and living you know, in a state of desperation um, for the rest of their lives. So I would hope that as we build this movement to end mass incarceration, we will not be tempted to make purely fiscal arguments about the need for reform, but ensure that the way we engage in our advocacy helps to inspire much greater care, compassion, and concern for the very people who have been locked up, locked out, and that we have been taught to despise. But when you look back historically at slavery, condoned by many people who quoted the Bible. When you look at what happened after the Civil mm -hmm. War, it took a civil war to free the slaves and then they were put back into a form of slavery with the coerced uh, labor, forced labor. And then you some Jim Crow laws you refer to, you look at the racial violence that extended right on through our time. Where do you get any hope that this ideal of compassion, that, that we can treat a society such as you describe, given our conflicted, often savage past? I, I get my hope from this revolutionary idea that doesn't seem to die in the United States. Um, this idea that all people are created equal with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That was a revolutionary idea <laughs> in the Declaration of Independence, and it was wholly incomplete. It was all men are created equal, and implicitly slaves were left out, um, you know, poor people were left out. Women were left Women out. Women were left out, right. Um, but it was a revolutionary idea then, and it remains a revolutionary idea today. This idea that keeps changing and growing and expanding as our consciousness changes and grows and expands, that all human beings are created equal and have certain inalienable rights, it won't die. It didn't die with slavery. You know, a war was necessary to end slavery. But this idea has continued to survive and it's continued to grow. And we see now that in the United States, we do believe that women are equal. We have an idea that people of all races are created equal. We are now beginning to see that depending on, regardless of your sexual orientation, you are equal. This idea itself has not died. Um, and so I think the worst thing we can do is to fall into a sort of cynicism where we imagine nothing can ever be done. Um, you know, these new systems of control just keep being born. This is just part of human nature. Well, it may be part of human nature to fear one another, 
Um, but there is also a part of human nature, I believe, that wants to see uh, the equality, even divinity, in each other and to honor it. And that spirit remains alive in the United States today. And if we give up on it, then I think we're giving up um, on the dream of truly thriving, equitable, multiracial, multiethnic democracy. Michelle Alexander, thank you very much for being with me. Thanks for having me.